Welcome to week four lab, and we're going to be doing the respiratory system. So here's some of the stuff that we're going to be looking at. Here is your right and your left lung, and it doesn't matter which way you look at this because you're going to know the left has this notch for the heart to stick into it. So you'll always know the left. And then the other thing that gives it away is the right one has three lobes and the left one only has two lobes. So another little giveaway there. And then you're going to need to know some of the parts of the respiratory system. So oral cavity that would be your mouth and your nostril, also known as a nares. And these folds in your nose are called the concha. And the space between the concha are the meatus, or meatuses, if you're talking about several of them. And then you have the nasopharynx, so it's the back of your throat that's closest to your nose. And then your oropharynx is the part of your mouth coming down, or excuse me, the part of your throat coming back from your mouth. So oral means mouth. And pharynx means throat, naso means nose, and pharynx means throat. So we, you break up the nasopharynx, the oral pharynx, into different areas depending on what uh, openings you have into them, what they're close to, but it's still just your throat. Here's one picture showing you some of the sinuses that you have. A sinus is a whole in your in your bone so you have the frontal sinuses in your frontal region the ethmoid sinuses are going to be near your ethmoid bone sphenoid sinuses by your sphenoid bones and your maxillary sinuses remember you when we did the skeletal system and you learned the max max i can't even say it <laughs> the mandible and the maxilla so these are the maxillary sinuses. Here's a cartoon picture of the same thing, but it helps a little bit. Here's your eye socket and your eye and your frontal sinuses over your eyes. You can see the ethmoid sinuses right about where your uh, lacrimal gland is. And then the sphenoid sinus is right below it. So they're very, very close together. And then your maxillary sinus. So it's a little bit below the nose, below the eye. So if you get a sinus infection, that's what they're talking about. So depending on which of your sinuses is infected, that's where you're going to experience pain. I found another picture that makes the ethmoid a different color than the sphenoid, so you can kind of see the difference between the two. So as you're reading over the first page of the lab, you're looking at the what the respiratory system does. It brings oxygen. It removes carbon dioxide. So that's important, but it also warms and moisturizes the gas. It also cleans the stuff out of it. So you it would be amazed if you put like a filter in your nose and filtered out some stuff and then put it on the microscope slide, all the things, the particulates that you suck into your lungs during the course of a normal day. So we have hairs that help filter that out. We have the concha that warm and moisturize the air coming in. Uh, we have mucus, so it's really sticky, and all kinds of things stick down in it so that it doesn't go down into your lungs. You also have white blood cells that will eat uh, foreign invaders if you uh, breathe in some worm eggs. Every time somebody dives for first base and I see all that dust fly up in the air, I'm thinking, oh, man, do you know how many worms and worm eggs are in that? Wow, and you're sucking that right up in your lungs. One of my young relatives 
came to me now that she's much older and said, I remember you telling me about all those worm eggs that were in the air and in the dirt. And so you made me never eat my boogers. And I went, good for, the, good for me. She goes, yeah, but was it true? We're going to learn the upper respiratory tract, and these are the words that you're responsible for knowing and being able to identify, and the lower respiratory tract is this one. So we broke the pharynx, which is your throat, into the nasopharynx, which would be the upper part near your nose, the oral pharynx, which is your uh, mouth, and the laryngeopharynx is where you go down and you get to the voice box. So the larynx is your voice box. And some people put the trachea as part of the upper respiratory and some people put it as a lower. So it just depends on whose book you're looking at. Most people have the larynx up in the upper respiratory. I will tell you that. Most of them don't, don't put it down here. The trachea is usually the cutoff between upper respiratory and lower respiratory. And then we talk about the bronchial tubes. So you know the primary bronchial tubes is the first one, and then the secondary is a branching off or a bifurcation. And then you get to the tertiary, and eventually you're going to get down to little teeny tiny bronchioles. And when you get down to the little teeny tiny bronchioles, they actually can help with the gas exchange. The alveoli ultimately are the things that do the the majority of the gas exchange, but the bronchioles are so small that they can assist. The thing that I hope you guys learned when you were in lecture class is that from the trachea on down, you have cilia, and they're going to be beating upwards and try to push mucus up, up, back up to the larynx where you have a splitting off place where you can either go into the trachea or you can go down into the esophagus. So you probably have, have noticed that before because sometimes when you're trying to eat something and swallow and talk all at the same time, your food goes down the wrong hole. So you opened up your epiglottis, you opened up your vocal cords, and you allowed the food to go down the wrong path because you were opening it up so you could get air through. So the epiglottis serves to shut off the uh, trachea so you don't accidentally swallow food down the wrong, or down your windpipe. So there's a lot of fancy words here. We're talking about terminal bronchioles and respiratory bronchioles and the alveolar ducts and then the alveoli. So according to this, everything from the terminal bronchioles up are just conducting. The air just passes through, it gets cleaned, it gets warmed up, it gets moisturized, but you don't really exchange gases. The business end of it is when you get down to the final, the respiratory portion, is the respiratory bronchioles, the very last ones, and the alveolar ducts and the alveoli. So they're, they're where the actual um, oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange takes place. This is what your um, trachea looks like right there. There's the cartilages of your trachea, and they're thick and thin, which is nice because you have sturdy, firm cartilage so that you don't collapse your windpipe, but then you also have a little bit of soft, thinner in between, and it allows you to bend your head forward and backwards and around. And you have your cricoid cartilage here and your thyroid cartilage here. And what's important about these two is if you're going to do a tracheotomy, you're going to do it in this area. So if you have cancer of the mouth, or if you are choking, somehow or another you're not getting air down your trachea to get it to go on down into your lungs, you can bypass the whole nose and the mouth and put a tube right here, and then you can breathe out of it. So 
uh, I mentioned in, la in lecture, I find it so incredibly uh, astounding, that's, that's a nice word for it, that people who have mouth cancer from smoking will smoke their cigarette through the tracheotomy, through the hole that somebody had to make in their trachea so that they could breathe out of their, their trachea. So anyway, the, uh, that always just astounded me. The hyoid bone is right here, and it doesn't articulate with any bones. It's kind of interesting to me that the thyroid cartilage is up here, and that's the laryngeal prominence. So that would be your Adam's apple. Guys have a big one, and girls have a smaller one. So guys that want to uh, have a sex change operation, a lot of times will have this shaved, some of this shaved off, so that their voice is not so deep. And what's interesting to me is the thyroid gland itself is below the thyroid cartilage. It is not across the thyroid cartilage. The thyroid kind of looks like somebody put a little butterfly and wrapped it around your trachea, right there underneath the cricoid cartilage. In this picture, they show you the epiglottis is above the hyoid and above the thyroid cartilage, above the larynx or the voice box, but it doesn't actually show you the epiglottis. You can best see the glottis and the epiglottis if you look down the throat. So here's somebody, they're uh, coughing and they slowed it down really slow so you get the full effect. Here's the glottis and here comes the epiglottis being pulled down so you're not letting as much come through here because you're pulling the epiglottis down. And then those are your vocal folds, or we call them vocal cords. That's a cough in slow motion. This is the posterior view of the larynx. So you see the thyroid cartilage that we saw up here. And there's the cricoid cartilage right here. And you can also see it coming around in the posterior view, in the back. And those, those rings that you saw in the front of the trachea right there do not extend all the way around to the back. And what fits right here in the back is the esophagus. So if you are going to put air in someone, if you're going to intubate them, you have to make sure that you go through here and end up in the trachea. And you don't go through here and end up in the esophagus, which is right behind it. And the same thing if you're putting in a feeding tube, you don't want it to go down into the lungs so that you put the food into the lungs and drown the person in food. You want to make sure that you're in the stomach before you start pushing food through the tube. One of the hard things to do is to be able to identify things from different perspective. So if you're looking down the throat, now the thyroid cartilage looks like this. The cricoid cartilage looks like this. And the arytenoid cartilage is a little pyramid-shaped point of attachment for your vocal cords. So the epiglottis is that fleshy uh, stuff that we saw, and it would be in this region, and then we saw on either side of the vocal cords the glottis. So the epiglottis would be on top of the glottis, and then we saw the vocal cords attached to the arytenoid cartilage. So if you, if you can kind of see that picture and then see where these things are and the points of attachment, it helps you uh, learn the, the different cartilages. Here is a little bit of a close-up to help you a little bit with some of the words. Also, you have the anterior view that we saw 
So you can orient yourself with the hyoid and with the thyroid cartilage, the uh, laryngeal or laryngeal, depending on how you want to pronounce it, prominence, or the Adam's apple, and the retinoid cartilage. And if you look, see there's the cricoid cartilage. There it is in the front. Remember, that's where you do the tracheotomy. And you come over here around the back, and this is what it looks like. And then they take the same thing, but when it branches off, they call it the excuse me, a retinoid cartilage. And then if you go, there's like a little hook on it at the top, and that's the corniculate cartilage right there. So this one thing has three areas, and they want you to know the three areas of that. And then the cuneiform cartilage, you can see from the side over here. So those are the things that they want you to know. And in your picture, it doesn't show, but there's this ligament that is holding this cartilage to the hyoid bone right there. If I were you and I was trying to learn this, I would look at this picture very carefully from all three angles, and then I would pause the video and go back to the picture in your book and look and see where these things are. So it's so hard to see in the book where those different um, arytenoid, cuneiform, and the corniculate cartilage is from just this teeny tiny picture. I think we've talked about everything on this particular picture with the exception of the carina. And it is the place where the trachea branches off into the right and left bronchial tube. So that's the bifurcation right there. And again, you always know the right side because it doesn't have the um, cardiac notch right there. So you know this is the left side and you end up with the secondary bronchial tubes branching off of the primary. Here's the primary, here's the secondary, and then as you keep branching off, then you get down into the tertiary. And then you, all these down here are the actual bronchioles. And you have little bronchioles branching out here also, all the way. But they're only showing the ones down at the bottom. Attachment for the epiglottis here. We're looking from the side. So here are the rings, but you notice they don't come around to the back. So you're looking at the side. And the cricoid cartilage looks kind of thin in the front, but it gets a lot bigger in the back. And there's the place you put the tracheotomy. And here we're adding two more things. The vestibular ligament which they call the false vocal cord, and the true vocal cord, which is the vocal ligament. So you have two ligaments in there, but this is the actual one that we saw flapping in the breeze as the person was sneezing. Nothing too much new on this particular slide. The upper lobe is the superior, and the lower one is the inferior. And then the one in the middle is the middle. So pretty easy. And the left side only has two. So you have the superior and the inferior lobes. We talked about the cardiac notch. That's where the heart uh, pokes into the lung. And they call these things fissures. And because they're not straight across, it's not a horizontal fissure or a vertical fissure. It is an oblique fissure. And you have oblique fissures over here. But you do have a kind of a horizontal one. So it's kind of going across right there. Here's where the lungs sit on the diaphragm. And remember, when the lungs inflate, it's because the diaphragm contracts and pulls down. And when the diaphragm pulls down, these things are riding on it. They're kind of stuck to it with a, with a fluid, and so they ride down. 
and that causes them to inflate. And then when it relaxes like this, it bows back up and pushes. It pushes against the heart and it pushes against the lungs. So here's your list of things that you need to know. Your nostrils, I think everybody's pretty familiar with your nostrils. If you put your finger in your nose like you're going to go digging for gold, then you're going to be in your nasal cavity. And if you wet your little finger, you can actually stick your little finger back through the nasal cavity up between the folds of the concha into the meatuses. So it's kind of fun and weird if you want to do that. So just wet your little finger and just slide it through the nasal cavity and keep going back. And you can feel those folds. Then we have the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and no, oh, we don't have the laryngeopharynx. They left that one off. But anyway, that's the third one. And the larynx is your voice box. It has the Adam's apple. It has that. Uh, prominence that sticks out there. The thyroid gland, remember it looks kind of like a butterfly wrapped around the trachea, and it's in the front. It's in the anterior view. And the tracheal cartilages look like rings, but they don't extend all the way around into the back. And the carina is the bifurcation, where you go off to the left and the right. So you should be good to go with that. And the larynx model, the hyoid bone's easy. You got that one. The thing that sticks way up the highest is the epiglottis, and that's where those tissues are attached. And then the glottis are on either side of the vocal cords. Thyroid gland. Oh, look, I have it both places. Thyroid cartilage, cricoid cartilage, cuneiform cartilage, arytenoid cartilage, trachea, and tracheal cartilages. You just need to get the... Uh, models and look but remember that the cricoid comes on up and is named two different things as it comes up so but it's pretty much the same one all right the bronchial tree again you have the hyoid bone trachea tracheal cartilages bifurcation carina left and right primary bronchus secondary bronchus bronchial tubes tertiary, and then you branch out the little bitty baby bronchioles, the vocal ligament, and the vestibular ligament, the false vocal cord. Looking at the lungs, ooh, superior, middle, and inferior, so you know you're talking with the right lung. The horizontal and the oblique fissure, and they all rest on the diaphragm. Left lung is superior, inferior, oblique fissure cardiac notch, and it sits on the diaphragm. So other than the larynx model, I don't think you're going to have any trouble uh, identifying things on this. And if we were doing this in person, we would have you go from table to table and label the various things that we laid out for you on the table, but we don't have it there. So the one other thing that we would do in the lab is we would have you use the microscopes and you would look at the various respiratory tissues under the microscope. So you're going to see ciliated cells that are pushing mucus. You're going to see goblet cells. This is what the lining of the trachea looks like. So you have these columnar cells. And because they're scrunched together, the nuclei are kind of up and down, so it looks like there's several layers of them, but there's really just one layer of cells right here. And so we call this pseudo-stratified. So it's fake stratified. So you're like, oh, here's one layer, and here's one layer, and there's one layer. And that's not true. There's just this one layer right here of these tall columnar cells. And these cells are called goblet cells right here, and they're secreting mucus. So they're just squirting mucus up here. There you go. And these are the cilia. So this is called ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelial cells. So that's, that's the full name of it. And these goblet cells 
pushing out the mucus, the cilia pushing the mucus towards the up, 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 towards the um, voice box, the larynx, the point at which the esophagus and the trachea come together. So you have to have the epiglottis that closes off the airway if you're going to swallow something. But when you're asleep, it can be open, and the cilia can just push the mucus up, push the mucus up, and then it slides down the esophagus. So sometimes you wake up, and you, you got like a, it sounds like a frog in your voice. You kind of, <coughs> you got this stuff in there. That was because your cilia are doing their job, and they're pushing it up. So you just kind of clear your throat a little bit when you wake up, and away you go. So this is the this would be one of the histological tissues that they would want you to be able to identify with the goblet cells and the cilia, and then underneath it, of course, you've got the the uh, cartilage for the strength, because again, you don't want your airway to collapse. This is a really neat video. This is showing you the alveoli, and watch what happens when I run the video. There, you can see the capillaries. I'm going to pause it. You can actually look through the alveoli and see the capillaries touching. The alveoli are squamous epithelial cells. They are flat as a pancake, and they allow gases to easily pass through them. So this is squamous epithelial cells, and then the capillary is squamous epithelial cells too, but it makes a tube. So this is making like a grape cluster. These are your alveolar cells that make up the alveoli. But these are, because they also have blood in them coming through, you can't see through them. But if you took the blood out, you'd be able to see through them. So let's continue on. So you're actually, they've got a teeny, tiny, teeny, tiny camera that they stuck down in the alveoli. So here it is right here. And you can actually see the blood rushing through the capillaries by looking through the alveoli and into the capillaries. So we're inside the lung and we're down in one of those grape-like sacs and we're watching the blood go by. And as it goes by, it is dropping off carbon dioxide and picking up oxygen and moving on. Isn't that neat how it's going over and branching off? So it's covering all these squamous epithelial cells that make up the um, alveolar sac. So that's all the information I have for you on this particular topic.